Everybody. Welcome to another edition of Sunday Night Football with Bengal Jim and Friends. And Jamie, that was an awesome uh, little add to the uh, the Bengal growl there right before we came on. Thank you. That was awesome. Just glad it worked. Yeah, good stuff, guys. So, hey, on the screen, uh, as usual, just as introductions, a uh, uh, gray shirt there. You can see our buddy James from, from Indianapolis, Brownsburg, Indiana. And we've got Jamie from Saskatoon, Canada. Uh, <laughs> Saskatoon. <laughs> is that any from Brantford, Brantford, Ontario? Is that anywhere close to you, Jamie? Where in the hell's that at in Canada? Oh, no, Saskatoon's out west. <laughs> you guys are getting actually getting further and further every time, actually. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Good stuff. So we took a week off last week uh, with Memorial Day weekend, and we're back at it and got a great lineup today. Pretty excited about it. Some really fun guests today. We have uh, Glenn Bujnock, uh, offensive lineman, uh, played for the Bengals for many years, played in this, uh, was a member of the Super Bowl team. We'll have on here uh, to open us up. Uh, Steve Tate, uh, Steve, the owner Tate. Uh, everybody should have seen images uh, of Steve Tate, the owner. The giant cheese head from Green Bay, it says the owner on it. Uh, he is also president of the Pro Football's Ultimate Fan Association, uh, which we'll talk to. Really great guy. He'll be a fun conversation for us. Uh, we have a special guest today uh, for our Bengal History 101. Uh, we have Greg Cook joining us from Sports Cooking, Sports uh, Cook Sporting Goods. So we'll we when you when we get to that point point of the show, you'll understand how uh, that will tie into some history here, and it's a it's a really cool thing. I think most people in the area don't know about. Uh, we have our fan of the week again this week. Uh, a really uh, intriguing question to throw out to you guys as well, and uh, so we, it is it's going to be a fun show. Fun show, guys. We appreciate it, Jimmy. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, we took last weekend off. Hope everybody had a great Memorial Day and hope everybody's staying safe in this crazy world that we're living in right now, especially with all the uh, riots everywhere. So thinking about uh, everyone, hope everyone is uh, safe and excited to get the uh, show started. Thank you, Jamie, for the, uh, as Jimmy said, the new intro music. Yeah, man, I missed you guys last week. It didn't. We, there's no. Uh, there was no holiday up here. I was just coming out Sunday. <laughs> oh, goodness. Fun. So um, I know we have a bunch of people lined up here. Um, uh, just let me know when when uh, Glenn gets in the. In Glenn, the room. He's here. Okay. Uh, hey, we could go. We could go to him right now. Let's James. Jamie, have anything else you want to add before we get going? No, we're good. Let's get started. Let's roll. Let's get. Let's bring Glenn on. Glenn Bushnock, how you doing, buddy? We're doing good. How are you guys tonight? Good, man. Good. So do do a quick introduction here for you, Glenn. So just to kind of catch people up and, and let them know, you know, you you were drafted uh, in 1976 by the Bengals out of, in the second round out of Texas A&M. Uh, member of the Super Bowl 16 team. Uh, played for the Bengals for seven years. Went on to play for the Bucks uh, Buccaneers. I think 83 and 84. Uh, his sons, Austin and Digger, played uh, football at University of Cincinnati. Had fun watching him play at UC. Uh, great man, great family man, Glenn Bujnock. We're we're really happy to have you, buddy. Hey, it's hey, it's great being here. You know, uh, very fortunate to be where I'm at. And uh, I, when you called and wanted me to do it, I'd be glad to do it. And uh, you do a great uh, bio, bio there. Uh, good job, Jimmy. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Appreciate it. <laughs> So we're going to have a lot of interaction from people that are following on Twitter and YouTube. So there'll be some questions we'll throw at you. But I had my own list of questions, Glenn, uh, that I wanted to throw at you. 
So as I was digging and doing some more research on you, uh, just when I thought I knew you, uh, I found some more stuff on you, Glenn. So, so uh, oh, hell. I did not realize that you in 1977, actually, we're going to go ahead and play a very short video clip, Glenn. I want you to see this and see if you remember this clip. Um, this is a play that, uh, that we, we want to talk about here. So hopefully you'll be able to see this. Reeves replaced Ken Anderson, who had suffered a thigh injury. Trailing again by 13 with a minute and a half left. The in <laughs> you scored a <laughs> touchdown in 1977? Talk about it. <laughs> hey, Monday night football. Out of, out of the blue, I mean, uh, it was supposed to be a bootleg, and John Reeves was supposed to follow me to the left. And, and then when you read people's face, faces across the line and everybody looks in one direction and I look back and all of a sudden John Reeves do this lateral pass out to me and thank goodness I caught it. And as the old <laughs> line is, I tippy toed in for a touchdown. So uh, I, I got four, I averaged four yards a carry and every time I touch it, I score. <laughs> How about that? That's great, man. No, not too many running backs can say that. I know that. <laughs> Hey, I'm in the bingo book, man. That I'm in. I'm in a scoring book, which is hysterical. Oh, that's too funny. That's great. Did you so, see the uh, football, Glenn, or did you spike it and go on to the next play? No, there was a big commotion as to whether it was a forward pass or a lateral, and everybody's yelling at the ref. The Steelers, Mel Blunt, who almost took my head off, they're yelling at the ref, and the ref looks at me and says, "What was it?" And I said, "It was a lateral." So he just turns up and gives a touchdown. I said, here you go. And I gave him the ball and ran off the field. So it would have been better if we'd have won. <laughs> we didn't need to talk about that, Glenn. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my phone lit up when I got back. Man, I'm like, Jesus, Monday night football. And I had no idea. But thank goodness I caught it. That's all I can say. <laughs> That's great. So it was not a design play. I kind of figured that that was the case. But thanks for walking us through that one. So another, another not a whole lot of Bengals offensive linemen in history have actually scored a touchdown. Uh, but also, I think Glenn might be in the Bengals record book here as well. So uh, Glenn is uh, married to Sue, who used to be a Bengal cheerleader. So we have a player marrying a Bengal that had to be like a big no-no from the organization, I would think. Right, Glenn? Oh, it was, it was taboo. You couldn't do that. She's not allowed to... Uh date football players and so and so the crazy thing is that when she first saw me she thought i was a bouncer in a in a club and and the first time i saw her i didn't even know she was a cheerleader until before game and i'm out in the field before the game starts and she sees me and then i see her and i had i had no idea so we broke the rule and 40 years later we're still we're still chugging along here <laughs> that's great that's great um <laughs> couple other things on here so the, the other point so you got to play for so you didn't play for Paul Brown as the head coach so his last year coach was 75 so Bill Johnson coached you for a couple of years then Homer Rice and then Forrest Gregg um I, I really I mean so was Paul Brown still involved so I, I would really like to see if there's any Paul Brown stories that you could share with us live and just kind of talk about PB or I, whatever well he was like <clears throat> I always make a statement about Paul Brown as if if Paul Brown walked into a room with his with coveralls on, a straw hat, and a T-shirt, people in the room would just look and say, who is that guy? Who is that guy? He just had that persona. Uh, Paul was very prevalent because when you're a rookie, you're scared of the man, and you're scared of, you know, the veterans tell you about the man and the whole league. So, But the man had respect. But a funny story was that uh, I had a motorcycle. And I was riding my motorcycle, and we leave a meeting one day, and Paul says, uh, Glenn, come here, can I talk to you a minute? And I walked over, and he said, I said, yeah, Paul, what's up? And he said, I understand you're riding a motorcycle. And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, not a good idea, and just walked away. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> riding on the wall. No. So you never sold the motorcycle again? Uh, about a month later, I sold it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hey, the old man, can't, old man can't tell me what to do all the time. Come on. 
<laughs> so we love the the, the um, from from Homer Rice to Forrest Gregg. We talked to Max Montoya uh, and Pete Johnson weeks ago, and it was interesting. They pretty much shared the same theme when we, you know, about Forrest Gregg and the, the difference from one coaching philosophy to the other. I'd love to hear your take on the transition from Homer Rice to Forrest Gregg and uh, in eighty. Well, the crazy the, the crazy thing was Homer. Homer was a mental guy. Homer was envision yourself and, and and see yourself catching the ball, see yourself scoring the touchdown, see yourself making the block. And and offensively that, that those years we scored a lot of points and set some records. But defensively wise, it didn't you know the D lineman didn't seek, uh, seek in too much when Homer's talking about positive thinking and people are eating in the back of the room, you know. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we went through that that change, and then Forrest came in, and Forrest was, I'm going to be disciplined and disciplined and disciplined, and we bumped heads a few times about stuff. But uh, you know, one thing I will say about Forrest is that he treated everybody the same, everybody the same except Munoz, because he was, I think, he was scared of Anthony because he's bigger than him. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, who was your favorite teammate, Glenn, throughout your career with Bengals? Oh hell, God! In what fashion? Uh, <laughs> On the field, after the games. Who was your drinking buddy? Oh, uh, I uh, a lot with Tom Dinkle. Dinkle, Dinkle, and I shared a lot of good times. He, we roomed a lot together. So uh, I would say Dink. Yeah, and he. I got all my bad learning from him, so he was my problem growing up in the league. So I blame it on Tom Dinkle. The the traveling now is obviously all airplanes, and you know, get to the hotel day before all that. What was it like when when you played? Was there any bus trips, or did you guys fly everywhere um, back then as well? Yeah, we flew everywhere. You get. You get to the city and you have, you know, you've got that evening. Well, if you have a night game the next day, then you can, you know, you can relax more that evening. I'll say that. And then when you got a one o'clock game, you can't relax as much. But, you know, you get some time to go out a little bit. But you, you see some family if you're in that town. But generally, you know, you just go out and have a couple of refreshments and chill out before the game. So I did that a few times. We've got some comments from the uh, fans, Jamie, if you want to um, pop those on the screen. Sure. And then, Jimmy, we also have the other video clip as well. Yep. We'll, we'll hit uh, we'll pop, pop one of these questions. I mean, hey, hey, Glenn, we're getting a lot of uh, love on, on our tweets, on your, our messages here about Bush's chicken. <laughs> yeah. So Chris says, Glenn, love the chicken place on Glenway Ave. So what are you doing now? Well, well, right now, no, not fried any more chicken, but – no, living back here in the in the well, I've been for like the last oh thirty five years back here in the woods, and uh, I've been quarantined for thirty years myself. So, uh, <laughs> no more chicken. If somebody wants a good tasting breading, I know what they can have, but uh, I'm not going to mop the floors and clean the fryers out anymore. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work. People don't understand how much work that actually is. Uh, John, uh, in what was it like having your sons play college football that either play any pro? Oh, uh, you get to watch them. We never missed a one. We, 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 it's like when my parents, when I played, my parents, if they could feasibly go to the games, we'd go to the games. So when uh, Digger and Austin both played, it was, oh, we get to go to this city and this city and this stadium and things. So it was great as, uh, they, they excelled. They both did very well. Uh, as far as going the pro route, uh, hey, as I told them both, they're going to be a lot healthier and wealthier at, at, at my age, you know, at their age than I am. They uh, they got good careers. Austin's coaching at Youngstown, and uh, uh, Digger's a financial consultant, and my daughter, Annie's in real estate. So, hey, they haven't moved back home and asked for money, so I'm very happy. <laughs> Uh, we do have one more question from Kevin Braun. This is a good one. Glenn, do you feel the game has sped up, slowed down, gotten better or worse with the different rule changes since you played? Oh, God, so much into the replay. Um, they, they're going to go for that 
that three hour limit, three and a half hours, and the NFL will do whatever they have to do is like uh, golf changing rules for for play. So, um, I don't know. It's about the same. I think that they, uh, oh, how do I say? It's more glamorized than it used to be, but I think it's about the same time links. Um, it's just a whole different ball game. It's still it's still football. And that's why when when my son uh, Austin was a De- Ohio Dominican, and we go to a game and there's 1,500 fans there, but they it's still football. It's still football, and they play tough, and you can glamorize it, but it's still football. So we got a a, a video we want to play here, Glenn. Another very short video, and we'll, we want some want to ask you some questions after this video is played. <laughs> Oh, hell. He's got nervous. another one, Glenn. <laughs> he's nervous about what video clips he's going to be. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Williams and Glenn Bouge, not the offensive lineman. Gentlemen, what do you think of the uniform? Well, basically, I like them. They, uh, it's something new, new change that we, uh, I feel we need. Uh, it's more, it has give, gives a little bit of notice when you see it on the film. You can easily notice the team that uh, before you couldn't. I'm pleased, but it still doesn't. You know, make you win the game. You still got to win the game. Yeah. Okay, let's let's take a look now. If we can pan down and let's take a look at the socks. And these- so, Glenn, the, the first comment I get on that thing is, your hair was awesome, brother. I loved it. Uh, <laughs> I found out I was going to do that about two hours before we went out there. And, and I had no idea what to wear. I, I would just... I, I thought we were just going to wear the jerseys and the helmets, but then I found out, and I'm so glad I wore support material. Um, <laughs> so it was I I I just didn't know, and I was I was had a few uh, uh, beverages before I went on there and things. So uh, uh, <laughs> it was a surprise. And Reggie, of course, Reggie, he was never lost for words, and he had to describe everything to an intent. So. No, it was fun. I did that for Alheim. Alheim was a great guy, and he asked me at the last minute, and I said, sure, no problem. I love to do it. So what's funny about that is, like, a lot of our younger uh, viewers right now, I mean, they weren't around for the 1981, you know, new uniform reveal from the old pumpkin head, Bengal helmets to the new tiger stripes. Your honest (laughs) opinion, you probably couldn't give it back then, but today, what was your first take on that? Uh, You know, going from, at the time, just – the craziest looking thing probably people ever saw. What was your opinion on it? My first opinion was they're going to have a hell of a time replacing all those stripes after a game. That was the, that's what I told Tom Gray, our equipment manager. I said, holy crap. And what they had to do, they ended up with decals. And they had these decal things that went on top of the helmet so they could put them on because they're not inside the lacquer they were stuck on. So, yeah, Tom Gray didn't care much for him as far as having to replace him after every week. It, uh, to the guys who actually hit people, not the guys that stood on the sideline. <laughs> it is funny. So I have a an old uh, – this is a helmet from, I think, the early 90s. And what Glenn's talking about, these stripes on here, they were decals. So they would yeah. peel and crack and get hit. And so now they're sp- now they're painted on, so they don't have that issue anymore. But uh, – but, uh, oh, they're yeah. big time now. Oh, it's big time now. You know, all lacquered in there, emblems in there, and stuff. <clears throat> they got more money now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> were other were other players when you guys went out and played and put on his stripes for the first time? I know you kind of felt a little uncomfortable, probably. But were other players like making fun of you, fun of you guys during games or before games and warm ups? Oh hell yes! Oh god yes! That was. I remember Greg Bingham with the Oilers. He's going, what in the world are you guys doing? I mean, what is this stuff? You know, <laughs> oh, no. They, it was strange and crazy, but they, everybody adapted to it. After, you know, after the ball, first time the ball gets snapped, nobody cares what the hell you're wearing. Yeah, yep. it's true. Too funny. <laughs> it's, James, no, it was you have anything else? Anybody no, else got any? Everybody, I've just com- completely filled you guys up with all the information you need, huh? <laughs> I could go on and on, man. I'm just trying to have somebody else. <laughs> so, I guess, you know, I do have another one here. I mean, so at, being at Texas A&M, you grew, you grew up in Texas, I think, correct? Right, yeah. Okay, so going to Texas A&M, talk about, you know, 
when you got drafted, how do you did you know you were going to the Bengals? How did you find out about it? I mean, what was your initial impression? How, how did that work during draft for you back in those days? Well, the draft back then was a uh, I had I was told I was going to go maybe in the first round and then make definitely in the second. So it's like three thirty in the afternoon, and I'm going. No word, no word. So we took off, and me and a roommate of mine just went to the store and got groceries because we were going to have a party that night, you know, with beverages and food. And when we got back, they told me that the phone call came, and so I called the number up, and 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 to me, I'd never been to Cincinnati, didn't quite know where it was, and they said, you know, going. I said, oh, so. Uh, Riverfront, no, uh, the Three River Stadium, and uh, it was Jan Paul, uh, Mike Brown's secretary. She goes, no, it's the, uh, you know, Three River Stadium. So, uh, and it was like four o'clock in the afternoon, and and so about two or three guys got drafted that day, but that's when it went to another day, and they were like so many rounds. So I had a whole lot of guys that night that were there for food and beverages, and they didn't get drafted. But that year, I think we had. 13 or 14 people drafted for my senior class. So uh, it's not like it was. We just took off and left, and you got a phone call. Right. Not uh, not who gets to be a millionaire day on draft day. Right. Yeah. So we're going to take one more question from the uh, from our, our viewers here, Glenn. I think we've got a couple more. We'll just pick one more, and we'll, we'll let you go. We appreciate your time. Yeah, sure. We will go with uh, Josh. Ask, Glenn, your most memorable moment as a Bengals player. Uh, my most memorable moment as a Bengal player. Oh, hell. Oh, hell, getting drafted, get, hell, getting drafted in the second round. That was a great thing. And the other one's a Monday night football touchdown. And the other one was I found myself a Bengal cheer earlier on the sideline and married her. You're in trouble now. That? that was a third. That was third on your list. Sue's listening. I can't count. I, got, I played offensive line. I can't count anymore. <laughs> Yeah. Just don't put me on just, just don't put me on Jeopardy, okay? I'm yeah. <laughs> well, Glenn, we'll let you go. Respect your time. It, it means a lot you coming on with us. It's awesome. It's just we love uh, you know, talking to the former players, former legends, and and just kind of picking your brain and hearing some stories. There's stories here that you shared with us tonight, Glenn, that I guarantee you tons of folks watching right now have never heard before. So we pre appreciate you sharing them. <laughs> Get the unedited version. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, 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 man. We appreciate it. Appreciate hey, it. Jimmy, thank you. But you, you guys be good. Thank you very much. Who day, buddy? See ya. Okay. <laughs> Hold off those videos. Where I don't know where you find those. Don't give. Don't uh, reveal your source. But uh, those are sweet. Yeah, those are yeah. The eighty, the eighty-one uh, uniform reveal was was sweet. I didn't know it was like two hours before it was done. He he got asked to do it, so that's something new. I love it. I had a couple beers before I went out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's keep going here. I know it's uh, we're trying to keep keep on track for this hour show. So, hey, our next guest um, is Steve, the owner Tate, and is he he's in the waiting room right now? I think. Yes, sir, go and bring him on. Steve, welcome to the show, buddy. How you doing? Doing great, Jim. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on, guys. Absolutely. Thanks for being with us. So uh, I believe it or not, uh, James and I met Steve a few years ago up in Green Bay when we went up to the game. He gets pictures and talks to thousands of people. He didn't remember us at the time. Uh, it was a few years back. And then uh, last year, uh, I was um, involved in Pro Football Ultimate Fans Association. I was an inductee into the, that organization last year. And I got to spend some time with Steve during the uh, reunion last year up in Canton. Got to know him. Um, just like he looks like right now, a really good guy, good dude. And uh, we're very happy to have him on. So we have a lot of we're going to have a lot of questions from uh, our viewers, Steve. But I, I mean, I really want you to talk about I mean, the mission uh, for PFUFA um, is something I sh truly feel passionate about. Uh, James and, and Jamie on the monitor here with us are part of our tailgate as well. And we've got the PFUFA flag flying at our tailgate. And um, I would love for you to share the, the mission and, and a little bit about the PFUFA. Great. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, I think I want to just set up uh, before getting to the PFUFA. I'm a 
kid grew up in Wisconsin and uh, we really didn't have anything, you know, but I've always been a Packer fan. I don't remember ever not being a Packer fan. I grew up in the sixties when they were really good and uh, just out of my passion, just finally got to go to games and then I became a shareholder. And I was just so excited about being a shareholder that when I got my share of stock, uh, I grabbed the, uh, my mom bought two playoff tickets right after I got my sh first share of stock. And uh, I was going to a green, a green Bay home playoff game. My first one ever. So I just grabbed my cheese wedge, which we all have one laying around, right? Okay, anyhow, so I grabbed my cheese wedge and uh, had my sister put NFL owner on it. I wasn't even thinking. I just was, I don't know why I didn't go GBP owner or whatever. I just said, ha, I'm kind of like Jerry Jones because I have a st piece of paper, right? Well, it was just all fun, but it was a, a passion. And I go there, and here's what I say to people. Because I wear insulation on my head, I've got to meet people like Jim and so many great people across the country. And I mean, I grew up poor and bullied, and I just never got getting on fans that come into your town. Uh, I just maybe it's more of the Midwestern kind of friendly, northern kind of country kind of thing. But man, we're appreciative when people come to Green Bay and come to Wisconsin. And and then when I got to the PFUFA, I just at first I just didn't understand. I thought I really don't. Want, I'm old enough now. I don't want to go someplace and just be in the literal arguing and you know really a lot of that sarcastic you know playing each other down. And when I got there, Jim. Man, it was amazing. It just, everyone was so kind and they were so friendly and they really believed in fellowship and sportsmanship and charitable activities. And what does charity have to do with football, really? I mean, well, are you a taker or are you a giver? You know, you, because you have something unique like a cheese wedge that says, oh, <laughs> you get on TV a little bit. So, you know, are you giving back a little bit from that or not? And when I got to the PFUFA, Pro Football's Ultimate Fan Association, Man, they just elevated my game. I just, you know, there were people there you, I've seen on TV. And then you've seen like the Hoggets raising $120 million for charity. You just go, I don't even measure up. How can I use a little bit of my platform to help others and to be a part of? And that's why I say it just elevated my game. I was in, you know, a small little pond, especially the smallest in, the, you know, Green Bay. And now I'm in this across the country and international organization that have some of the coolest people I've ever met. So it just really up my, up my game and caused me to want to be even better at what I do, open up our tailgates, be more friendly. And just, uh, it's, uh, it's just a blast. I met some of the greatest people in the world. And I, like I said, because I wear insulation on my head. <laughs> well, Steve, I want to thank you for, for joining us. As Jimmy alluded to, we had the opportunity to visit Lambeau a couple years ago and what was I think the top two or three hottest games ever at uh, Lambeau I think it was the third game in September it was the first two games we didn't score a touchdown so here there's four of us Jimmy uh, Jimmy's son and our buddy Craig Johnson were in the stands and finally third game in we score our first touchdown and we were like partying like it's 99 and the fans like what the hell's wrong with you guys? You just scored a touchdown. It's like, you don't realize it's three games in. We finally scored one. But, uh, man, it was – You changed your right. officer coordinator that game, didn't you? Uh, we had a new one, yes. We had yeah, a we new one we that, uh, that game. And uh, it was um, it was a warm one for sure. But, you know, you alluded to the, the game day experience, and we had a, a great one outside Lambeau. In addition to checking out the town, the houses across the street, um, what they do is – is unique, unlike anything else you'll you'll see in, in the NFL. But tell us what uh, your game day ritual is or what uh, you do leading up to uh, the game. So a couple things, you know, people always will get hold of me now. And the coolest thing about social media is that people are coming into Green Bay for the first time and you, you get to be a little bit of an ambassador and, you know, tour guide and talk about stuff. But people always ask, what's there to do uh, in Green Bay outside of uh, Lambeau Field? Not much. <laughs> you into paper mills? You into? I mean, it's just there. It's a it's a town of a hundred thousand. They're friendly. So my game day experience is I live two hours south of Green Bay. So I have to uh, get up probably about four four thirty, and I drive up to Green Bay to get in line with the people that I tailgate with for lot one. That's on the east side of Lambeau Field, outside of the United Gate, and that's probably the part of the cool part of it other than having to get up real early is you're there with that gang and that's before the, the craziness of the tailgate kicks off so all your buddies guys and gals that you're friends with we get there and that gives you a good hour hour and a half just kind of mingle and talk and then it's kind of this race to get in the lambo field because they come in from a couple different ways and 
Then they finally shut Oneida Street down, and then we get in position and jockey in, and then we wait another half hour, and then we get into the tailgate area, and then that's a, a quick rush because you only have four hours, and then I like to get into the game about an hour ahead of time, so then it's only three hours, and it just, you know, you get all set up fast, and people are coming and going, and it gets gets to be just packed, you know, and that's that's just the lead-in to get to the game and, you know, to get in there and with your buddies and pals and cheer for your team. So it's uh, and you get to meet people from all over the place. I meet people from around the world. So it's really a lot of fun. It's really, uh, I know people say I can see it better at home. Yeah. Just visually looking at the game. Yeah, I got it. But the, all the atmosphere and the ambiance and all that tailgating and then the feel of the crowd when you're in there and we're talking Lambeau field, man, we played there since 1957 in that same spot. There's no place. I mean, we got the history. It just, and we're and, and we're friendly, like you said. It's like a college town with the houses right there. So it's just a blast. What's well, it's funny, funny, Steve. Uh, when we were up there a few years, I've been up there many, many times. Uh, but uh, we uh, were driving around the the houses across the street, just checking them out. So we we're on the other side, and uh, told my buddies James. I think James was driving. I said, "Stop the car." And I got out, walked up to a front door, knocked on the door. I just wanted to see if they let us just go in the backyard and see their all the stuff they had set up for the next day. They had a you could see it from the other side, right? They had a, a, a rooftop deck. They were ready to go. This guy said, no problem. Went around, opened up his garage door front and back. Um, three hours later, we left. Um, <laughs> we, we, we just wanted to say hi. They were the nicest people. We tried to give them. They kept feeding us, throwing us beers. And uh, that's not what we came for. We kept trying to give them money and they wouldn't take it. We did leave about 60 bucks on their table in the kitchen they didn't know about, they found later. But that, to your point, um, you've been to 24, 25 plus NFL stadiums across the country and you, you expect to get heckled and yelled at. Just That's just the environment, right? Uh, I can tell you Green Bay, Steve, is the only city I've been to uh, where I have not gotten that treatment, which is really a, a testament to uh, the fans of Green Bay and and really to the mission statement of PFUFA as well. Right. Cool. And it is. And, you know, that's what I've gotten to by I started going the road once I knew people from the PFUFA because I want to have a safe environment. I mean, and that's been the cool thing, too. But I will have to tell you guys, I was at a game in Cincinnati there where we just you guys clobbers. We fumbled the ball and at the end we're driving and you won it. It was the last time I think we played there in Cincinnati is the only place where I've been hit by a fan. Physically hit. But let me tell you, I'm leading up because I'm leading this the wrong way. So that was the day of the game. We lost. We get outside. I'm with Who Day. We're going to go up to Oktoberfest. It was, that was going on, so we lose. But it was just everyone was still. The, the tailgate was great. We're walking up, and there's a fan cussing out Who Day. And I look, and I see it's a Packer fan. I go, hey, that's not how Packer fans operate. I walked up. Now... They start cussing even more. Now they're dropping F-bombs. And somebody grabbed me by the back of the sleeve, and I kind of looked back and stepped forward. When I did, she hit me in the chest. The only time I've been physically hit is in Cincinnati by a Packer female fan. <laughs> she punched me right in the chest. And I just looked out. I looked up and go, you got to be kidding me. So it was a good lesson. I don't care what colors they're wearing. It, <laughs> they're good drinking. point. Who knows? So, yeah, I know I let it one way, but it was a female Packer fan. It's the only time I've been physically punched at a game. Or after it, that makes uh, it, it makes us feel better. You had a scare to there for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, another note: before we go to uh, before we go to the fan questions, one unique thing, and this is I'm sure other cities have it, but it was we got in like Thursday or Friday. I think Saturday we're driving around Green Bay, just checking out the back streets and things like that, and we came upon a curling center, the Green Bay Curling Club. Which we're like, and Jamie's from Canada. They, they see that all the time. Us down here in the states, we don't, uh, we don't have that. So we're excited. We're a couple beers in. We're like, damn, here we go. We're gonna go curling. And they were closed for maintenance. But again, in in Wisconsin hospitality, the the club manager, I guess he was, let us in, gave us a tour. We got to um, see. I don't. What do they call Jamie? What are the pucks? Stones? Rocks. Uh, yeah. Rocks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we got a, a chance to check that out. Bought a couple t-shirts. And that was cool. So if you plan on going to Green Bay, check out the Green Bay Curling Club because that was definitely a uh, unique uh, stop. Yep. We have 14 of those in the state and four right within a, uh, I don't know, 20-mile radius down by me. So it's 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 real popular in this state. Yeah, for sure. Of course, we got enough ice here. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Uh, We got a couple fan questions, guys. I'm going to go with those. Okay. Yeah. 
Peace. Uh, Chris asks, I have a question for Steve. How long has the PFUFA organization been in existence? It's been around since 1999. It started out with the Visa Hall of Fans, and Visa actually was inducting fans into the Pro Football's Hall of Fame. And that can continue from 1999 to 2004. And then uh, Visa said, hey, either all the NFL teams use Visa or we're going. And, of course, one team didn't. And I think we all could probably guess which team that is and what owner in Dallas would do that. So they stopped uh, that whole program. And then Pro Football's Ultimate Fan Association said, hey, we uh, have a, a pretty unique, fun organization here. We'd still like to see it grow. So now in 2007, 2008 and uh, to the day, we have a draft. So it isn't just uh, – writing a bio and having somebody in some back room read it, you have to some, have a fan in the Pro Football's Ultimate Fan Association give you a draft card. You have to then uh, be vetted out through our draft process and then our interview process, and then a whole thing becoming a draftee to becoming a potential veteran to then come into Canton at the reunion. And so it's a, it's a pretty unique honor to be a part of it. it we're not elite. Uh, we're not you know that way, like we're some big elite thing. It's just very selective, you know, just like the Hall of Fame is a selective in their members. And so it's a lot of fun. It's something that I I'd, I'd, I'd tell you, I'm very glad to be part of it. I'd recommend, you know, doing getting to know other members and working at that and being that it's a lot of fun. Uh, speaking of tailgate, Tommy would like to know, what is your favorite tailgate food? <laughs> well, in Wisconsin, you know, usually it's brats and cheese. But I'll tell you, I'll go for seafood every day of the week. When we tailgate in Canton together, it's pretty hard to beat with the Baltimore Ravens with their uh, seafood and what the New Orleans come with their gumbo and their different food. So uh, I'd probably say that pretty is probably more of my top. Uh, I obviously go with a good steak or meat, but uh, in Wisconsin, it's mostly brats, cheese, and hamburgers. <laughs> Cheeseburgers. Cheese we heard so much heard that week there. That, yeah, those four days we were in Wisconsin, it was just became a running joke. We didn't even want it anymore, but we just ordered it just to have it. Well, guys, this could be pretty funny because Kevin suggests that they need a PFUFA bond spiel. So, Jimmy, if you know, want to get on the ice and do some curling, there we go. Got it. Got it. A curling tournament. Yeah, to kind of build on what Steve was saying, so I, you know, I was vetted here uh, by some other Bengal fans that had already been involved in it, and and Hude Baby was, uh, I think, my my sponsor uh, during that process, and um, I went through probably a, a year long vetting process to to put myself in a position to be inducted into the PFUFA organization, and even after I was, you know, handed my draft card, which was basically an invitation to go to Canton and potentially be in, in, inducted, I really didn't have a true feel because it was kind of my first time hearing about it. So I told my wife, I was like, I'm going to go up there. I may be back within, you know, half a day. I don't know how this is going to go. And I get up there and um, these are the nicest. I mean, every team is represented in the NFL. Uh, a lot of them have multiple representation uh, in the organization. Uh, you know, two nights of tailgating and, and, um, ceremonies and all kinds of stuff going on. And like Steve was saying, uh, some of the other teams, uh, tailgates that were set up were just amazing. So it was actually a lot of fun fellowshipping and hanging out with, um, believe it or not, Steeler fans and Browns fans. And we were all getting along, having a great time. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And I've that since that weekend, I have a full understanding. And it's, 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 it's something the NFL needs more of. Uh, that mission statement is pretty important. And uh, anytime anybody that's watching right now goes out of town for a game and you want to find a tailgate in that opposing city, um, I will tell you, you're going to want to look for the flags, the PFUFA flags. Those are friends, even if it's from another team, um, team there at all. So it's, it's a great organization. Uh, this isn't something you just can't join and get in. Uh, you're going to have to get to know some of the other folks that are involved in it and, you know, um, and make sure we don't just let everybody, anybody in into the organization. There is a vetting process to make sure we're getting the right people in in the organization. I didn't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that, Steve. Well, like you said, Jim, I'll tell you my first experience too. It's almost overwhelming because you're kind of you're kind of ready for some confrontation and some heavy jesting and jousting, and it's just the opposite. And so I just and then you just meet so many people that are just really cool. And it was so after a while when you're there. Uh, you don't know if you're going to be in or not, and it almost gets to be really uh, 
concerning because now you really like it and you'd really like to be a part of, but you're still knowing you're kind of being evaluated and, uh, it's a, it gets to be pretty nerve wracking that first time there. And I try to remind that to people, you know, once you're there for a while, you get to know people, it's a lot more to relax. But when you come there your first time, especially as a potential veteran, it's pretty nerve wracking. And we keep, you know, they keep you busy and you're going to events and stuff from, you know, the first play to the J babe, to carrying flags, to helping out here and doing backpacks and float jobs. It's just a busy week and you almost have no time at the hall of fame itself, which you think you're going there for. Right. So it, it, it really that's that's what I think it, it said to me it did to me it, it got me to elevate my game and that's where I came up with the term I'm a fan of fans because I now go down to Soldier Field and I this, my Bears buddy longest rival in the NFL he said hey why don't we just swap tickets I'll just sit with you every year when we come up there and you come down here and sit with me and I went great and he's got front row right by where they come out I've got you know I'm up on the 35 yard line about 45 rows are great for watching the game but they're not right down there right on the sideline his are, but we just swap tickets and I go and you go and stay in people's houses that, you know, and our arch rivalry, you know, to the Vikings, man, I know so many good friends in the bears and Vikings and lions and then the rest of the NFL. So you, it really spins around your rivalry to really some super camaraderie and all like family. And I know that word gets bandied around, but you know, we just rally around each other and we do stuff. And that's why this year is so hard with this pandemic and everything up in the air that, we don't we're not going to meet as much or see each other yep. so it's just it's really a hard thing when you have to be separated from family members like we are which we all are going through right now right yeah yep. well steve man we we appreciate your time uh we want to respect it. i think we're right at our time here it means a lot and we we appreciate everything you do um we we want to continue to get the word out about the pf ufa mission statement i think it's important for for that that message to be heard by everybody and uh, keep the thing rolling. But we appreciate everything you do, Steve. And thanks for coming on with us. Hey, guys, thanks for having me come on. And I'll tell you what, it's a, a privilege to be able to talk about the PFUFA even more. It's a privilege to serve and try to help and be a part of that organization. And I've been lucky enough to have a few different roles in it. So, and they're really positions to help serve and give back. And so, thanks, guys. Thanks, James. Oh, appreciate James. it. James. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. So to be a host here, you have to start with Jay. I, I just realized that. Yeah, okay. Hey, and we have the common with you know Forrest Greg. That's Tim right. Rye of your suit. He was a Wisconsin boy. Your Super Bowl team. Yeah. It was great hearing Glenn before. So thanks a lot, guys. Have a great day. Be safe. Good luck to you, too, buddy. Thank you. So really cool, man. I, I you know you know one of the things that you know James and I when we were years ago kind of getting the tailgate kind of taking it to another level. Um. You know, one of the things we want to continue to do and, and grow was our charitable contributions and, and, and participating with local charities and helping them out. And that has grown for, with us every year. We've helped out multiple um, nonprofit organizations and charities in the Cincinnati area. So uh, a lot of that ties right into obviously what the PFUFA mission statement is as well. Yeah, I mean, we started off with what Kenny Anderson. Um, we've done stuff with um, Icky Woods, uh, who we had on the show with the Javante Woods Foundation. We did stuff for the high schools um, when we brought um, the the growl back, which was pretty exciting last year. Or so um, we did stuff for the Marines. Um, you name it. That um, that list grows, and you know, as you said, Jimmy, it's. A big part of the tailgate and um, something we look forward to doing, um, you know, every year and and definitely uh, giving back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Steve's a super nice guy. Yep. Yeah, really good dude, man. Just um, that was a great weekend last year up in up in Cannes. It was a it was a great time. It was good stuff. Good people. Yeah, it, it was just crazy the year. You know, we talked about you know Green Bay and everybody thinks of frozen tundra and all that and. You know, we knew whatever the year was, the year before, hey, we're going to go to to Green Bay. I think we played Jacksonville the, that year. So my thought was I'd like to go up to Green Bay in December, freeze to death, and then fly directly from uh, Milwaukee to Jacksonville and, and defrost on the beach the next week. Yeah. So it didn't work that way. We played, you know, September, I think it was 21st. I think it was uh, the wife's birthday. And, man, it was it was hotter than, than, than Hades up there that uh, – that day, but it was uh, it was cool, and I just like I said, as I mentioned in the thing, I remember we scored our first touchdown three games into the year. It was a, a rough start to uh, to that season, but uh, oh well. 
That, that's funny you said that because I remember we acted like we went crazy when we scored a touchdown, like we won the Super Bowl. And all these Green Bay fans are looking at us like, it's just a touchdown, guys. What's the <laughs> – uh, I was just impressed you guys knew what curling was. Yeah, come on. All right, I got a lot of great pictures and videos to share that night too, which yeah, we cannot yeah. air. I don't think we can air all those, but uh, there's some funny ones. <laughs> yeah, I think some of them may be on uh, – matter of fact, I think on the, the YouTube channel, if you haven't checked out the other stuff um, – I think your first trip there with Aaron was little. Um, I think the, the Ben Two thousand nine, I think, something like that. Yeah. So if you go back and look on the YouTube channel, there's definitely some some videos and some cool stuff from some of the uh, away trips or road trips that we've done over the years. Do we have uh, John in the waiting room yet, Jim? Uh, we do. Uh, Greg and John are both there. Okay, let's go. Uh, we're gonna go with. Uh, we're gonna go. The, we're gonna do the fan of the week right now, right? Yep, yeah, that's that's work. Go ahead. All righty. Hey, John, how are you, buddy? Hey, guys, how you doing? Appreciate you uh, coming on. John Barker is our fan of the week, and it's a, an interesting story, probably 10-plus years ago. John, you, you can probably tell exactly, but the Bengals message board, um, you know, was – there still obviously is that, but I was on the Bengals message board one day, and there's like a, a section of the message board, and it says – tailgating, upcoming games, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And there's a post on there that says um, extra ticket for Oakland. So the Oakland uh, Bengals game, first one to respond, it's yours. I just happened to be out in, in California for work uh, that particular week when I was planning on going to the game. I was like, man, this is a win-win situation. So I hurry up and, and type, type something and said, hey, I don't even know who this is, this person. I said, I'm going to be in Oakland. If you still have that ticket available, I'm in. So John um, responds. He says, sure. And I didn't know much before that. I, I never met John before, again, through other than the, the Bengals message board. I knew um, he was a Bengals fan that hung out at a San Francisco bar. There was a Bengals. Uh, I'll let him talk about that. And he says, just meet me in the whatever our buses, our bar Tail is uh, having a bus, and we're going to head over to Oakland. We'll tailgate it before. We'll meet up, get the ticket, and that's that. So that was my um, first meeting with uh, with John. I was actually in L.A., so I flew up from Burbank to to Oakland uh, that morning. I don't even think there were Ubers then, so I took a cab from the airport over and uh, met John. Is that a pretty good uh, synopsis of uh, how we first met? Yeah, I mean, that's basically about it. I think that was back in 2008, 2000, 2009. Yeah, it, uh, yeah that, that was exactly it. Ten years I ago, had a, I had an extra ticket I'd purchased for my wife, and she had just she ended up having to have shoulder surgery and uh, wasn't able to attend the game due to the surgery. And uh, you were the lucky one to to reap the benefits. <laughs> now, yeah, obviously, you're a Bengals fan, but your wife is not. Um, both of you had a chance to uh, attend a away game that we went to a couple years ago in in New Orleans, so. Before, I guess we'll talk about the wife situation after, but tell us how your uh, Bengal fandom started, John. <laughs> I, I was born into becoming a Bengals fan. Um, I was literally wrapped in a Bengals blanket, blanket when I came out of the womb. So I've been a Bengals fan since uh, I took my first breath. Nice. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, when I met you, obviously you were in San Francisco on the, on the West Coast. You've moved a couple of mm -hmm. times. Now you're in um, New York. So despite yep. all the um, travelings, I know you've had the opportunity to come to the Jets uh, Bengals playoff game in Cincinnati, maybe two thousand or whatever. Nine, two thousand ten, I think it was. Yeah, nine. That was uh, that was a cold. We were talking about the heat of Lambeau. That was game against the Jets. Was, uh, was that a cold was my one. first playoff game? It was a playoff game. We won't talk yep. about that. But uh, <laughs> that was, uh, being away, you know, how do how do you stay in touch? You know, what is your the method to, um, I know you try to go to games when you um, can tell us uh, how you stay in touch, you know, living in, in the Southern tier of New York now. Um, I'm pretty active on the Bengals board. Um, what was formerly as the uh, Bengals forum, which was officially run by the Cincinnati Bengals. But once they shut that down, um, it became the Bengals board. And then I'm also pretty active on uh, the Bengals Reddit sub forum. Uh, so between that and now this podcast, it's how I try to stay engaged with other fans that are that are displaced. Before we go to a, a question from the uh, the people watching, 
Who's your uh, favorite Bengal of all time, John? And 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 how did you? Uh, <clears throat> it's got to be Ocho. I mean, he he brought something to uh, the fans at a time that there wasn't much more to like other than the stripes on the helmet. So. Okay, um, definitely, Chad. I, my biggest memory of Chad is the the Hall of Fame jacket that he donned uh, oh, for sure. Line yeah. there with a. HOF and then the question mark of um, what what year? Tell us what it's like living married with a big um, man and a, and a house divided. Um, I mean, I, I've essentially become a Saints fan by proxy. Um, and being a New Orleans girl, she's also a big LSU fan. And now with uh, having Burrow, that was very interesting to being able to watch his progression through this entire season of, of watching uh, LSU with with her. What do you uh, what do you expect for for Joe? Obviously, you're pretty excited about uh, us taking him number one overall. Oh, I expect everything. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, I think he's going to be great. Um, he's I think he's a perfect fit for us. What uh, what did you see? Obviously, watching all the LSU games through the course of the year that you think will translate into the NFL. Something we haven't seen a, a Bengals quarterback do in a while. Uh, excellent pocket presence. Like, I think he has some of the best pocket presence, um, that we've ever had as a quarterback, but is probably going to be a top five, uh, in the NFL. All right, Jamie, we're going to go to you if you've got a, uh, anything from the fans. Yeah. So Jack's wondering, what do you think our record will be this year? Uh, I'm hoping 11 and five, but I'll, I'll settle for a nine and seven. <laughs> 11 and five, seven for nine and seven. Yeah. Cool. So, so John, so tell me about, so when, how long have you been married? Uh, we've been married since 2012, so eight years. Okay. So during the dating process, uh, did the Saints conversation come up? How did this all work, man? I'm just saying. No, I mean, it's, I, I was able to witness the, uh, my wife's first Super Bowl win with the Saints. Uh, and that was back in what, 2008, 2007, forget what year it was. Um, so there's never been any sort of like tension or, or a uh, huge rivalry between us other than when the Bengals and the saints are, are, you know, battling it out, but they're, they're my number two team. So I, I enjoy watching them. And I'm that, a big fan of breeze. That must work too, because Cincinnati is normally a one o'clock game and the saints are usually a four o'clock game. So you guys are able to watch both. both it it does. Having yeah. Sunday night, having uh, the Sunday ticket, it, it generally works out that we're able to, to uh we're not battling over the tv yeah yeah that sounds like a good uh, good day of football well we appreciate your uh john uh, your time john for uh for coming on and, and thanks again for that ticket uh all those uh years ago in in oakland and then uh next time you're in cincinnati we'd love to uh have you by the tailgate yeah absolutely hopefully we can uh, make it happen this season awesome thanks yeah. john yeah, and appreciate thank you good day good day i'm cheers see you all righty, Jimmy. I'm at. I uh, appreciate John for uh, for coming on. It's a uh, unique story how we uh, met up there through the uh, message board. Which you know that's a that's a great avenue. If, if Bengals fans haven't done that before, um, certainly like to get on there, express some emotions, get some uh, anger out, and there's certainly some good banter back and forth um, with fans. Um, I think one extreme to the other. I don't think there's many. Oh, Really cool. You guys met on the message board and became friends. It goes back to a lot of what Steve was talking about, where there's the fans, you know, there's, there's a brotherhood amongst the fans, right? Yeah. 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 Cool so, stuff. It was, you know, it was cool. We talked about the road trips and, and Oakland, you know, was down at the time, although they beat us, but you know, while they have some, some crazy fans, everybody's like, Oh, going to Oakland is going to be, you know, terrible. But you know, they had the crazy face paint, they had the crazy outfits, but um, safe atmosphere. Um, and here's the other thing I didn't mention. John's seats were 50-yard line, row one, right behind the Bengals bench. So not only did I get a free ticket, but it was, I mean, one of the best seats in the house. It was uh, it was absolutely crazy. That was quick hand James' response there, man. You got it. <laughs> it unbelievable. But um, if our next guest is on, I think he is, Jamie. Or um, Yeah, so so we're going to change it up a little bit this, this week. We uh, obviously, you know, one of our more popular segments is the Bengal History 101. And we do some videos and talk about them and talk about the history around it. But we've got a special guest with us today. We have Greg Cook from Cook Sporting Goods, downtown Cincinnati, friend of the show. 
Um, and people were direct messaging me this week. was, why would Greg Cook from Cook Sporting Goods be on your history segment this week? Well, now you're going to find out uh, why Greg is with us. So, Greg, how you doing, buddy? Welcome to the show. Doing good, Jimmy. How you doing? Good, man. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being here. Before Jimmy gets started, we want to thank you for all the uh, the raffle prizes that have been donated throughout the uh, the course of the the weeks of the show. That's uh, that's been great. Um, I know uh, Jungle Joe won the the Joe Burrow jersey, and and we've shared those pictures and uh, the inflatables. So thank you very much for um, all those donations. We greatly appreciate it. Glad good. to be a part of it. Good. So, Greg, talk to us about the history, how you guys are forever tied to the Cincinnati Bengals organization, um, you know, from a history perspective, uh, what you guys used to do for the Bengals uh, and, and kind of talk about that. Because I, I guarantee you, nobody, very few people uh, know about this conversation we're getting ready to have. Well, you know, it's really uh, yeah, my dad kind of uh, the business is a family business. I'm actually fourth generation right now. My dad was the guy that became good friends with the Bengals original equipment manager, Tom Gray. And Tom and my dad did a lot of business together. And, uh, you know, back then uh, it was the local sporting goods store like us that took care of the team, everything. And not, you know, it wasn't no, no Nike involvement or any of the big shoe companies. It just wasn't there. Uh, it, it was a, a totally different beast. And, um, uh, we got in at the inception and sold them a lot of socks and jocks and medical supplies and a whole ball of wax. And uh, it was a, uh, it was a big, they're, they're a big customer for us. And um, the relationships with uh, the guys there were, were, you know, very informal. Um, I would go with, I mean, about the time, you know, in the beginning in 68, when, I would go down there. I was 12 years old. I'd go with my dad maybe and pop in to Spinney Field. And, you know, you there was no security. You you just walked in and you walked in and you could walk through the locker room. You'd see guys there. It was uh, a totally different experience. And um, they bought everything from us and actually another another sporting goods store in town. But uh, you'd go down, you'd have coffee with the equipment man and the trainer and hang out and I wouldn't have any coffee at that time. But as I got a little bit older, I'd stop in there, you know, six, eight years later, I got to, and it went on like that for, for quite a long time. So, so Greg, they, um, so I know you provided the uniforms. Um, you, I'm assuming you put the numbers and the names on them and, and those type of things. So you had, did you have players come in and picking their stuff up from you in the store? How did that all work? No, we basically dropped it all off. I mean, it, back then, everything was totally different. I mean, you, you, first of all, in the beginning, in 1968, we were selling them, the Bengals, most of their medical supplies. We were selling them um, socks and other things like that, practice gear. But to be the on-field uniform supplier, you needed to be uh, the sand knit dealer. Sand knit was what the most of the NFL teams were wearing in that day. And we were not that dealer. The dealer for that uh, brand was athletic goods service, which was a sporting goods store in the team business. Didn't have a retail location at all. They were down in the West end near Spinney field um, conveniently. And two years after probably 1970, is when my dad decided that uh, he wanted to buy that business essentially. So he bought athletic good service, brought that into uh, our business. And with that, we became the supplier for the uniforms. And at that time we would, you know, I mean, uniforms were different. They would not buy new every year. They would use them from year to year. You'd pop name plates off and change guys around. I think guys got the number that they were assigned and, and didn't really get this much say. It was just what was there, what was left over and what was in good shape because they weren't spending a ton of money on these things. So there was a question that um, somebody on Twitter put a message that they couldn't be here live. They're going to watch this on a, on a replay. And it, I think the, the, it was something he was asking about in 1988. Was there some sort of um, 
uniform change mid year from I don't know from one brand to another or something like that in 1988? Well, that's that's funny you asked that. I've got my 1988 Super Bowl. I love it. Love it. <laughs> it's um, in 1988 the Bengals went to champion from Russell Athletic. Russell Athletic was what they wore in '87. In '88 they went to champion, and that year. Um, the when they went to champion, a lot of the, the jersey patterns and things were changing back then. I mean, back then is when you know jerseys used to be all loose fitting and and you know hanging off the hanging off their body. Well, you know, I mean, in the Super Bowl years, we were Jim McNally was the line coach for the Bengals, and one of the reasons why the Bengals did so well is. That he was he put a lot of thought into how these players dressed, and uh, he was doing a lot of two way taping the jerseys to the players' shoulder pads, trying to make them fit tighter so that the linemen did not get held. Uh, we actually built jerseys that year, the Super Bowl year, for the linemen and the offensive linemen out of Gore Tex because we found that that fabric would adhere to the shoulder pads and we could almost compress them. That was the beginning of when we were lacing them on underneath the armpits and pulling them tight so that the guys couldn't get grabbed. So when you look at like jerseys back then, even though the Bengals were wearing champion in the 1988 season, they weren't all wearing champion guys were still wearing Russell guys were wearing the homemade jerseys that we made in the store. And it wasn't until they got into the big TV games, the championship game and the Super Bowl, that champions started putting a lot of pressure on them and saying, Hey, look, you know, we're the guys we got to see a C on the sleeve of all these jerseys. So, I mean, one of the best ones was when the champion, the champion jerseys all were more tight fitting and they had like uh, tight bands on the arms. Well, Boomer wanted nothing to do with that. And so we built him a, for the Super Bowl, a Russell jersey with the open arms. And um, I kind of got in a little bit of trouble because I put a Russell R on both sleeves of those jerseys. We were kind of big in the Russell business then. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great story man it, it, it's it's a great story so right before we let you go here i'm gonna we're gonna do a giveaway uh and this will be i think our last and bengal inflatable helmet that that cooks is uh is donating uh for giveaways so the question that we're going to need you guys to respond to and answer is and i don't know the answer to this i think i know the approximate answer greg will know how long has cook sporting goods been in business so uh the first correct answer will win that uh that inflatable uh bengal helmet Okay, I'll, I'll let I'll bring them up on the screen as they come into the chat. There's a little bit of a delay for the chat, so uh, while we're waiting for that, um, gentleman here, user Matro Bus says, "I bought a custom Burrow jersey. I'm amazed at the quality. Proud to support local. Thank you and who day." Appreciate sure. it, so Greg. For those that, um, and actually, I think was it last year, Jamie? I took you and, and Aaron to Cooks for the first time when you visited. So we were in town before. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm an out-of-town guy. We come down from Ontario, Canada. We go right to the pro shop, not knowing. And then you took us to this place, and I'm like, how did I not know about this place? This is crazy. This is awesome. Yeah, we so a bunch of for stuff. Those that are uh, out of town, Greg, can you tell um, tell them where they're located and uh, where you're located and how they can stop by when they're in town? Yeah, we're – you know, we're we're a block and a half from the state stadium, essentially. If you're down at the stadium, you just walk up Elm, uh, up the hill a block, and and turn right, and we're half block down on Fourth Street, right there on the right hand side. You know, I mean, we were the original Bengals Pro Shop before they had a Pro Shop. Until Paul Brown was built, they had no fan store. Yeah. So what was really cool then? I mean, if you were a Bengal fan then, and you came in the store, your chances of running into a Bengal in the store. I mean, it was every day. Those guys were there shopping for family and friends themselves. So uh, we, we kind of were a little bit disappointed when that, when the pro shop opened, we lost, a, we lost a lot of that uh, traffic. What, what, uh, you know, as you look at this, I mean, obviously with the excitement in town now of Joe Burrow being drafted and um, I mean, just on social media, the, the, 
the stuff that we're seeing. I'm, I'm assuming you guys are getting swamped with uh, Joe Burrow jersey sales, I would assume. Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow. We love it. It's, we're having a lot of fun with it. <laughs> got got some more in uh, like uh, yesterday. The orange ones in, and they're they're gone already. I mean, we just we're we're they, these guys are chasing it, trying to bring in as much as possible. I was gonna, say, I was gonna call you tomorrow if you had them in stock. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a there was a I think it's just a big one again. The three X guys aren't grabbing enough burrows right now. We still got plenty of those. <laughs> hey, Greg, what year? What was the last year, though? When did the NFL take the uniform stuff in house? Was it like mid late nineties, maybe? Uh, you mean as far as making it so that they were providing them? Yeah, that you were no longer would be able to do that with the Bengals. You know, I think it was. Yeah, I think that that could be. I can't remember exactly. You know, we. It's not that we can't. Up till even a few years ago, we were still doing nameplate changes and stuff for them. Okay. And, and, you know, the thing is, is, is as a matter of fact, I kind of remember doing something maybe just a year or so ago. I, I, it, it, they had, they know we're still there. We're still doing work for them. We're still doing, you know, practice jerseys and things like that for them. That stuff's still going on. We still have a business relationship, but if they can get it for free, they're not going to buy it from me. And right. that's just the way things have, have gone. And, you know, I mean, I remember uh, a Saturday, I mean, you know, one of the unique things about the, the game pants is that they're attached to the socks. Now when they pull them on the sock is part of the bottom of their pant. And, and I remember one of the guys pants came in and his sock wasn't there. And I had to physically on a Saturday go upstairs and stitch the thing on to the, the sock onto the pant to attach it. Cause that's I'll what they, damned. I'll be damned. So they still bring stuff in for us. Sure, right. we, have we, have a, we have a lot. Uh, of guests. Did you ask how many years or what year? Either, either one, whoever's the closest. Yeah, I, I said how many years I think is what I worded it, but I'm good at math. So we got 85 years. Uh, John says 1936, Joe 1940, Jack says 60 years. Luke says since 1888, so 132 years. Good job, uh, Luke. <laughs> another 1888. Um, let's see, Joe says 88 as well, 132 years. It looks like that's the popular answer. So, so Greg, tell us what the correct answer is. 1888 is the correct answer. Now, all what right. do you need? You need more inflatable helmets for all these guys who got it right, or what? <laughs> <laughs> is that how that works? We have seventy-two correct guesses, Greg. So, yeah. <laughs> <Holy moly. laughs> well, it's the first one, Greg. Just the first one. Just the first one. And so, Luke Atkins looks like is the winner there. Yeah. So, I'll just to clarify again, just that's we're going to go by the order we see it in. Sometimes people see theirs first. We see Luke as our first answer. Um, Luke and Chris came at the same time, but we see Luke first on our end. So, that's uh, that's who's going to get the prize. Got and then for those people that aren't in town, because obviously we have people from all over the world watching, Greg, can they go to the website or call? How else, if they're not in Cincinnati, how else can they get in touch with you in order? Absolutely. Cooksports.com. That's K O C H. And then sports.com or cooksportinggoods.com. Any one of them. We've got Bengal stuff on there. But truthfully, if you don't see what you want, call us because, you know, we've got stuff. I think I've got programs from the second Super Bowl still sitting around. So you never know. You know, give us a call if you're looking for something. And as you mentioned, you've done nameplates. I had an old, I think, Medea Williams jersey with the number 40 that you guys redid for Brian Leonard, did a Leonard nameplate. So, uh, you know, the full gamut from hats to uh, swag to jerseys, nameplates, you know, you name it, uh, you guys at, at Cook Sports have it. So we appreciate uh, what you guys do. Well, thanks. Thanks, guys, for having me on. I appreciate it. That was fun. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Peter. Peter. Appreciate it. All right. See you. It's good stuff, man. I mean, there's stories probably he couldn't share with us either. But man, I just, you know, I remember years ago going down there and seeing Bengal players in there. I'm like, what the hell are the Bengal players doing in here? Picking up 
their jerseys and their their some of their stuff that they wanted worked on. So that was a really cool segment. So it's, you know, it's not only Bengal stuff. I got a pair of uh, Reds uh, pants that I needed for when I go play baseball in, in Arizona. So they've got you know the full gamut for all sports, right, Jimmy? I think they do stuff for high school kids and everything. everything. I've I've ordered, you know, equipment and football and baseball stuff from from them for many, many years. And and I just I do want to be clear there. I would tell you that Cook's is the oldest sporting goods store in Cincinnati. Um, there are things that Cook's has that the pro shop doesn't. There's things that the Bengals pro shop has uh, that Cook's doesn't have. I would tell you my opinion, because I do this if Greg's still listening, he might get mad at me. But I go to both places uh, and uh, either they've both got their unique things that they have in there. And so I. And in the history of them providing a uniform for the Bengals all those years uh, was a pretty cool story. So, well, I remember when James took me there. I there was a lot of stuff there that they do not have at the pro shop. Yeah, which, which was cool to see. Um, our winner Luke also says that his high school Letterman jacket was done by Cooks. His yeah. dad didn't have it done there. So, yeah. and that's cool. You know, we we talk about the game being so I don't know corporate now and it, it's cool to see you know the the little guy there you know cook sporting goods doing doing that stuff back in the day and then still being involved you know as as greg said he had last minute name <clears throat> change and and the pants came in that uh, weren't correct he had a stitch a, a sock on so that's that's cool if you're in town definitely uh check it out well worth the um well worth uh, the block and a half north walk up um off elm street so let's, I think we have one more segment and then we've got a, a kind of a little bit of a special close for everybody here this evening. So I think we're to our question of the week and it's a, it's a unique one. I think it's going to stem some conversation for sure. All right, here we go. Question of the week. Who should the Bengals extend first? AJ Green, Joe Mix or Joe Mixon and why? Let's hear your opinion, Jamie. What, uh, out of those two, what would GM Jamie do? I think I'm going to extend Joe first. I'm going to, I, yeah, I mean, I obviously want both. Jimmy raised a good question. We were talking off air before we came on. You know, maybe one of the questions would have been, you know, who would you have to pick between the two? Like, if you could only extend one and not the other, who would you pick? Uh, I'm still leaning towards Joe, man. The guy's a beast. Uh, he's proved he's earned the contract, in my opinion. Obviously, I want AJ Green, but I just don't. Uh, I don't want to see the Bengals hand him uh, a whole bunch of guaranteed money. I think he needs to prove that he's going to stay healthy and play. Yeah, you know so, I mean? so what's interesting to me, I, I'm, I'm a little. Di- I'm not going to agree with our buddy up in Saskatchewan. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, in, in my opinion, uh, I, I love Joe Mixon. So remember, we're just talking hypothetically because I hope they extend both of them. But, so. I, I truly believe that AJ Green would be the one I would want to extend. I mean, you need you need AJ Green if he can stay healthy. He's going to be a big help, huge help from a leadership perspective, helping a young quarterback, um, everything involved with that. And, and the dude's a, going to be a Hall of Famer in my opinion as well. Joe Mixon, if it's one, I would take AJ. Joe Mixon, stud, stud, want him on here long term. But if I had to pick one, I'd go AJ just for the simple reason: as good as Joe is. I really, truly believe um, that we can find other running backs. Maybe they can't do everything that Joe does, but uh, I think we can find other running backs that that can uh, that can that can help us. Okay, so I agree with you. However, you said a very important word there. If he can stay healthy, that's the problem. He hasn't stayed healthy in the last two years, so I, I don't. I'm not comfortable with them handing him a huge bag of guaranteed money. I'd like to see him play the tag this year personally. And then, you know what? We roll out the truckloads of money for him at the end of the year if he can stay healthy. My Here's opinion. what I would say, and I would tell you, agree. Uh, A.J. Green is going to get the comeback player of the year this year uh, oh. in my opinion, if he stays healthy. So I hope, and, I hope when we roll the money out to him, he doesn't, he doesn't say take a hike and go somewhere else either. But it's <laughs> what you take on that. My, my answer is simple. Mike Brown would be so proud of me. I want the hometown discount. Going to go to Joe. And it's four years, forty million. End of story. Thanks for playing. We took the risk on you. Yeah, got you when nobody else would. Hundred percent. Deal. Yep. You're not going to get McCaffrey money, but you're going to get a decent little payday. Four years, forty million. I'll even guarantee twenty million of it. I like that answer, man. I agree with you. We took a ch- the Bengals took a chance on him. He was falling down. That no one was going to touch him. I mean, that was toxic. 
We took a huge chance on him. He proved that he's the player everyone said he was going to be. And uh, so now you pay him, but you're right. You get get the discount, man. Like, yeah. like, yeah. Uh, what do our fans think? All right. Uh, let's see. John says Mixon for sure. Jungle Joe says Mixon. He's younger. John says AJ, class and uniform, and Hall of Fame as soon as he's eligible. Tommy says Mixon. Bengals have Boyd and now Higgins. Running back seems more important, in my opinion, at this time. Uh, Jungle Joe chimes in again, says, agree with Jamie. Want them both, but AJ needs to prove he can stay healthy. And then Kevin says, I'd say AJ. I think we're deeper at running back as well as they're easier to come by. And that's true. Running backs seem to be, uh, you know, they're not getting paid as much as they used to anymore because there's such a mar- there's a huge uh, availability of them in the market. Obviously, except for you, you guys like uh, Elliot and uh, McCaffrey to sign that crazy deal in in Carolina, but that that's not the norm anymore, guys. Like the running backs, and we still have we still have Geo. Geo can still run the ball. The guy's still dependable. He's yeah, good stuff. Know. This this is a great, in my opinion, a great question of the week, man. I thought, I mean, it's it's a. It's a tough one. It's 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 tough when you start digging into this conversation and you've got the, the Brown family trying to make decisions around this. Uh, you know, this is some this is tough stuff, man. Uh, Chris chimes in, too. This is a hard one. I'd go with Mixon. I agree. He's a beast. But I remember when Lap was on, he said AJ's going to have a great season wherever he goes. I think we all agree. I mean, I, we're both we're all AJ Green fans. We want to see AJ. I, it really it hurt me when he was you know talking in the offseason how. He said he doesn't want to play on the tag. And, you know, it seems like he's coming around now that he actually got tagged. But I, I hope he sees it from the organization standpoint. It's like, you know what? You haven't played a full season in two years. Go out there, show us you can do it. And I bet you if you get halfway through the year and he's lighting it up, they're going to start. There will be a contract ready for him when the season's over, and it's going to be a boatload of money. Yep. Boatload of money. And he well, finishes his career as a Bengal and, and then gets the Hall of Fame. Guys, we've uh, we went way over our time. This is the longest we've ever been over, but it's been great, man. Uh, the guests have been awesome. Uh, it's good stuff today. But uh, uh, closing comments, you guys. You guys, J- uh, Jamie, Jamie, you go first. Um, well, we're going to close with a little segment as well. Just wanted to say, obviously, uh, up here in Canada, we're not we're not seeing the stuff happening down there. You guys have going on in the streets. So hope you guys are all staying safe. I saw some of the videos in Cincinnati. Kind of scary to see what's going on down there. But um yeah, it's to say everyone out there watching, it's crazy times, coronavirus, riots, and I just hope everyone's staying safe, staying healthy, and, uh, you know, respect everybody. So, James? I'll piggyback on what uh, Jamie said. Definitely uh, hope everyone's staying safe. And, again, uh, we appreciate everyone that's watched this show live or whether they go back and, and watch it on YouTube. If you have a suggestion, a comment, let us know. If you want to see a uh, player, personality, on the show let us know we'll do our best to make it happen if you have a suggestion for fan of the week question of the week um let us know this is again um for you so send it into one of the social media platforms and um we appreciate your feedback your thoughts and uh definitely keep sending all the comments in guys and and again this this is being done by fans for fans we love the interaction this is fun it's uh, this thing has really ca- caught some significant momentum since our, our first uh, show on draft night. And uh, we're going to keep this thing rolling and we appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and, 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 and participating. We're going to, again, we'll be back next week. Uh, one more, a couple quick things. Um, we're getting overwhelmed with, with requests for like t-shirts and the Bengal gym koozies is, is that thing is taken off like crazy. Uh, there will be an online store um, through Cooks that should be set up by the second week of June. Just keep an eye out on social media for that. Uh, if you do get a koozie, you have koozie resp- Bengal Gym koozie responsibilities. You, when you're sitting out by the beach and, and, and having a beer, um, we'd love for you to post and tag us on any of our social media platforms with that koozie. We're having a lot of fun with that. And uh, I was asked uh, many times um, the last few days, hey, on your show, we would love for you to give your feedback or your, what you feel about the George Floyd situation. And guys, I'm not somebody that's a, a technical person and gets in the weeds on a lot of things. Um, but we're going to close with this video. And I want this video to speak for how we feel, how I personally feel, um, how I want to feel moving forward uh, through all the current uh, stuff going on. So we appreciate everybody tuning in. Thank you. We'll see you next week. 
but we want you to watch this video. Uh, this is my response to everybody asking about um, the George Floyd situation. This is what we I want to see moving forward. My friend, you are just adorable.